and uh, welcome all as, as we start to get ready to go. Just uh, going to give people about 45 seconds here to get organized, uh, go into the virtual room, get pen and paper, and looking forward to this talk by uh, Todd Coburn. We're going to really dive into the specifics of catching, which is our first catching uh, specific talk so far. So uh, it's exciting and really looking forward to that. And um, just to give a little background here before coach gets started, uh, you know, Todd was a former minor leaguer, 20 years of running camps and clinics and um, being really, uh, you know, a teacher of the game in the last four, he's kind of found his niche as the catching guy and, spe and really specifying and working with catchers. You could catch him on social at all the major socials as the catching guy. And if you look in the chat, you'll see his website, shockingly, thecatchingguy.com. And so you can get, uh, you get a lot more information, but uh, we're gonna roll up the sleeves. We're gonna dive in and uh, let coach get, get going and talk about uh, the catching uh, position. Awesome. Thanks for having me, guys. Excited to be here. Anytime I get to talk about catching is uh, is good time for me. So I'm excited to be on. Um, one thing I will say is for those of you watching, uh, I'm easily distracted. So if I'm sitting here talking and, and, and talking about some fundamentals and teaching, and then I see a question pop up in the chat, I'll get distracted. So my point is, if you could, please save the questions for the end um, to give you a heads up, a little preview what I decided to do today. Um, whenever I do these talks, it seems like everyone wants drills, 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 drills. So, um, I'm going to go over what we call the big three of catching the big three skills of receiving, blocking and throwing. I'll spend, uh, I don't know, about five, 10 minutes discussing, uh, the fundamentals of each of those skills. And then we'll show you, uh, you know, five or six, maybe seven of my favorite drills and exercises for each skill. Then once I'm through all three sections, then you're welcome to ask any questions you like, um, and, and we'll do a little Q&A at the end. So um, I do want to introduce Tyler Kurbetsky. Tyler is a former international uh, player, has been to uh, way more countries than I ever have just to play baseball. He's traveled around the world, which is pretty cool. He's a good friend of mine now. And so um, I always jokingly say I'm getting too old and fragile to be jumping around on my hands and knees and, and demonstrating these drills and exercises. So Tyler will be helping me out for the, uh, for the talk today. So um, thanks to everyone who's attending. Looks like we have about 50 participants on. Uh, oh, hey, Lauren, good to see you on here. Um, let's jump right in. Let's dive right in. So the first thing I want to talk about is uh, receiving. Um, I think, uh, as I say, I think most of you know, I'm not sure the, the level of uh, experience you all have on here, but I'll tell you this. For those who haven't heard, for those who haven't been watching baseball in the last, I don't know, two or three seasons, um, receiving is by far, hands down, no contest, the most important thing we do as a catcher. We can have more impact on an at-bat, an inning, and a game with our receiving than anything else. And that's just come from all the, the data and analytics and video analysis and everything that they do nowadays. They literally film every pitch of every game at every level, and they analyze it, and then they've been able to, to what, do what we call quantify it and put a number on the ability of catchers to get strikes called. Um, and again, it's the, the easiest way to explain it is if you have a 1-1 one, one count, the catcher receives a pitch that could be called a ball or a strike. Sometimes we'll call it a stra ball. If we get that pitch called a strike and now the count is 1-2, the chances of that batter succeeding go significantly down. Uh, my numbers aren't going to be exact, but you'll get the point. If the count is 1-1 one, one, and we, we catch the ball, receive the ball incorrectly, and now it's 2-1, the, the major league batting average is somewhere above 300, probably in like the low 330s. But if you get that count to 1-2, you get that extra ball called a strike because you're receiving technique. Now the count's 1-2, that batting average drops below 200. So again, my point of explaining those numbers is our receiving will have more impact on anything else uh, on the game than anything else we do. So with all that said, when I'm teaching these skills, I have what I call my big three, the three most important things uh, we want to do in order to be a successful, uh, you know, receiving catcher, blocking catcher, throwing catcher. Since we're talking about receiving, I'll explain my big three of receiving. The number one most important thing with receiving 
is going to be timing. We have to be on time. And, and the whole idea is the concept is we need to have our mitt moving toward the strike zone as we're receiving the pitch, not away from the pitch. If we're late getting to a pitch, our mitt will be moving away from the strike zone. So you could even say, when I say timing, be on time, you could even say be early. We need to be under low pitches and working up. We need to be outside of pitches on the edges and moving in. And we want to get above that high pitch and be moving down as the ball is going into our mitt. Okay. So if timing is important, how do we stay on time? How are we on time? What's, what's the keys to keeping us on time or getting us there early? Number one is be relaxed. A relaxed body is a quick body. Anytime we tense up, we're going to move a lot slower. So we want to be nice and relaxed. That comes from breathing and that comes from getting some type of pre-catch move. Okay, so we show our target, we relax our target, we relax our hand, wrist, and form, even our shoulder a little bit. Um, a lot of you probably noticed that a lot of catchers now in the big leagues will either start with their mitt on the ground or they'll show their target, they go down and touch the ground and then work their way back up. That's a relaxation move. It's getting the body moving, that whole law of inertia, body in motion stays in motion. Um, and it's also helping them get below that low strike, starting down on the ground or at least getting to the ground, tapping the ground, touching the ground. So we want to be relaxed. And then the second way we can be on time, and this is going to be more for advanced catchers at the higher levels where their pitchers are, are you know, decently accurate, more consistently in the strike zone and hitting their spots. But another way to be on time or be early is get your mitt moving in the area of the anticipated pitch location. So if you're expecting a pitch down and into righty, that pre-catch move that you make, that relaxation should be in the area down and into a righty. If you're expecting something down and away from a righty or into a lefty, you're going to move your mitt in that area. That's going to help us. If the pitcher throws us where we want it to, if they hit their spot, we're going to be uh, – our mitt's already in that area, so that's going to help us be on time. So, again, number one, most important thing in receiving – for any of you taking notes, is timing, be on time. And how are we on time? By relaxing and our pre-catch move in the anticipated pitch location. The number two on the list, the second most important thing with receiving, and this is, again, this is in my opinion, I think a lot of catching coaches would agree, though. Uh, the second thing is going to be go ahead and move the ball. Okay, The old school mindset, and I was taught it, and I taught it for years, um, was to stick the pitch, just receive it, let the umpire decide if it's a strike or not. Well, with all this data and analytics and video analysis that they're doing nowadays, they've come to find that when we move the ball toward the middle of the strike zone as we're receiving, when we do it on time, catchers are getting a lot more strike calls, a lot more, okay? Um, and honestly, even if it was just a small percentage, any small percentage, anything extra, any opportunity to get more strike calls, we want to take advantage of that. So we really don't stick the ball anymore. We move the pitch. We move the ball. We manipulate it. Um, some of you that are on here that follow me already know I call it mitt magic. When it's done correctly, when it's done on time and done correctly, it's literally like a magic trick and the umpire cannot see it. So again, the second thing is manipulate or move the ball. Move the mitt toward the middle of the strike zone. And that leads into my number three of the big three. That's going to be give the umpire a nice consistent look, both with our mitt position and with the movements that we make. Um, I think an important point to make on this one is, and this can be challenging, if you are sticking every pitch that's in the strike zone and moving every pitch that's just out of the strike zone, the straw as I keep calling it, the umpire is going to pick up on that. So my point is, even when the pitch is in the strike zone, we still want to move it a little bit. We want to give the umpire a nice, consistent look. All right, so even if, if it's a strike, it's already in the strike zone, but it's at the lower part of the strike zone. As I receive it, I'm just going to give it a little subtle lift. If it's, a little, it's in the strike zone, but it's a little bit out to righty, I'm going to give it a little subtle pull. If it's in, a little subtle push, a little subtle roll, there's always going to be movement. You want to give the umpire a nice, consistent look. And then mitt position also matters. If there's any point that we have to go to a vertical mitt position as we receive the pitch, we want to get back to horizontal as quickly as possible. That horizontal mitt position, you have more mitt over the uh, plate, more uh, mitt for the umpire to see over your shoulder, and we want to give them a nice consistent mitt position. So just a quick review. Number one, be on time. How are we on time? By relaxing and with our anticipated pitch location, moving our mitt in that area. Number two, move the ball. And number three, give the umpire a nice consistent look with our movements and with our mitt position. So with all that said, um, now I want to have, I'm going to have uh, 
Tyler and I are gonna demonstrate some of my favorite drills and exercise. So whenever I do receiving, go ahead and grab the, uh, the four pound in the, in the back. Actually, I'll go to this side. Anytime we work on receiving, I think it's very important that we uh, incorporate some type of muscle activation. Um, the big fancy terminology is CNS activation or central nervous activation. Basically what I like to do when we're doing receiving is kick off the drill progression uh, by warming up the receiving muscles. Okay, so uh, the first thing you see, he's holding a four pound sand ball. Um, you can also use, depending on the age and strength and skill level of your catcher, you can use a two pound sand ball, but anything with some type of resistance. And he's just gonna do weighted ball or med ball figure eights. It looks like this. So nice big range of motion. He goes all the way above his head and then all the way down below his knees, just working the shoulder muscles because all those muscles are gonna be needed when we're doing our receiving drills. You can go anywhere between eight to 12 reps. You can even do two to three sets if you want to, depending on how much time and, uh, you know, the, again, the strength of your catcher. So that's, ca uh, that's doing uh, weighted ball figure eights. When we're receiving, and we just talked about getting the mitt position back to horizontal. So that movement is called pronation and supination. That's a super important, uh, you know, movement that we make trying to get the strike call. So we want to get our pronators and supinators warmed up as well. So he's got a little league bat with a donut on it, a 12 ounce donut. And now he's just going to do a pronation and supination movement. I call them windshield wipers. So he takes the bat head all the way to the floor, taps it down with a thumb down position, then comes all the way back around. Just working on the pronators and supinators in the hand wrist and form. Again, we're just working on getting the, uh, Basically, again, to keep it simple, the receiving muscles warmed up. The muscles of our hand, wrist, and forearm, the muscles, the internal and external rotators of our arm uh, and our shoulder. So after we do, and these are just a couple of my favorite. There's actually several more we can do. After we do that, then we start to get into some receiving specific stuff. So I got you. So I have some two pound sand balls. I like to kick off all my receiving progressions with some heavy ball. Again, working on the strengthening and then the stability of the muscles as well. So uh, working with some weight is gonna help the catcher develop those muscles needed to help move the ball, move the mitt, manipulate it. We want to make sure that we're controlling the ball and the ball's not controlling us. You can do these on two knees. You can do them in a traditional setup. You can do them in a one knee setup. Um, I actually recommend you do all of the, the different setups when you're doing your receiving because that's what's gonna happen in a game. So, uh, and you're just, you know, six to eight feet out in front of the catcher with a nice, easy toss. Um, obviously, if you're working with a young catcher, um, when I say young, like a, a 12U, um, the two pound sand balls literally could be a little bit heavy for them, especially if they have small hands. So you might even use, you know, one of the drive line balls or find something that's a little bit smaller that they can fit in their hand. But some weighted ball receiving looks like this. Go left knee down. So that's just a traditional primary. Now he's in the left knee down. Notice his hand is starting down near the ground. We want to get in the habit of working up to the ball. So start down, catch and come up. Go ahead and kick his little bit. Right knee down. Start down, catch So all I was trying to do there was start the flip lower in the strike zone, maybe even out of the strike zone. His hand is on the ground and working up to that and giving a little subtle lift or movement up into the strike zone. So we did our muscle activation with the figure eights and the windshield wipers, a little more muscle activation, strengthening and stability with the hit, uh, heavy ball, weighted ball receiving. And then from there, Now I'm just getting some baseballs. If you have an older catcher, you can always have them hold an extra ball underneath the pinky and ring finger. You can use a small foam ball. You can use a small golf ball, wiffle ball. Um, just for right now, I'm just gonna flip these to Tyler, but he's really gonna focus on receiving the ball in these three fingers. So once we do our strengthening, we start to progress. Now we're gonna start to do what we call pocket awareness. 
the more consistently we can receive the ball in the pocket, the better off we're going to be. I'll say it's, the, it's easier to manipulate and there's less wear and tear on our hand. So he's going to really work on, again, receiving these in these three fingers here, really in between the index and thumb, but we can incorporate the middle finger as well. So again, it's the same concept as the weighted ball, but now we're just trying to be a little bit more precise. The next step in the progression, again, there's actually, there's several more drills and exercises that I'll do if, I, if I'm out at a camp or I'm doing one of my lessons, I just have to abbreviate it so we have time to cover everything I want to cover. But after doing baseballs, we can even get more specific. I have these small foam balls, okay? Again, pocket awareness is super important. Not only, by the way, not only is pocket awareness important with receiving, but pocket awareness is very important for throwing as well. The more consistently we can receive the ball in the pocket, the easier exchange is going to be when it's time to throw. But you can use something small, something light, and have your catcher work on trying to just catch it in those two fingers. The more precise we can be during our training, the easier it's going to be once we have our mitt on in a game. So again, you can have your catcher do these on two knees. You can have them do them on the one knee setup, traditional setup, whatever. You notice that I've had Tyler do traditional, left knee down, right knee down, just for a few reps of each. So whenever you're doing receiving, work on all of them that they would be doing during a game. So this is just some small ball, some foam ball, uh, pocket awareness receiving, it looks like this. So you can see how challenging it is. Tyler's got a lot of experience, very strong, big, athletic, uh, experienced catcher, and he even missed some of these. It's pretty challenging. So again, we want to ideally try and have them catch it between their index and thumb, almost making like a circle and having it hit right where the pocket's going to be. Um, if it ends up out toward the palm, they still need to be soft enough to receive it, and that's great. You did uh, probably notice that he was still trying to manipulate, even though it's a little tiny foam ball, just trying to work on the uh, consistent mid actions that he would if he was in a game with a mid on. So that, again, that's another one of my favorite pocket awareness drills. From there, uh, go to mid on. Not everyone has access to it, but the next step in the progression from there, I typically use one of the uh, training mitts, All-Star has them, Valley gloves have them, but the little miniature gloves, the pocket gloves, um, the pocket trainers, I would usually use one of those. But again, I know not everyone has access to them, so we're just the next step in the progression now. He's got his regular mitt on. This is just what I call short toss location receiving. Um, we want to start working on the actions. I will say this, there are some catchers out there that start their mitt on the ground like we discussed earlier. Well, the best of the best, um, some of you on may know this, some of you not, Austin Hedges led the world in receiving last year, and he's a guy who will show his target, then relax the target with that pre-catch move, then come back to the ball. He was the best of the best. I'm going to imitate who does it best, right? So when I teach receiving, I like my guys to show target, especially if they're a lower level. Um, a lot of pitchers like to see the mitt at the higher levels. Most pitchers could care less. They're going to key off of a shoulder, off a mask, literally try and center punch your chest. But the younger pitchers typically like to see the mitt, so we're going to work on showing the target, then relaxing the target, then working their way back up to the flip. So when you're doing the short, short toss location, have the catcher work on that whole routine. But then also, I'm just going to do underhand short toss so I can be really specific with my location. So we'll work down and into a righty, down and away to a righty or into a lefty, down the middle. Remember, even when the pitch is in the strike zone, we're still going to have a little subtle move. But you can be really specific with each location and work on proper technique and mechanics while they're receiving. So we'll do traditional setup, left knee down, right knee down, with just some short toss receiving. It looks like this. So uh, down by the left foot. So relax down, bring it back up. Same thing, left foot. 
Right foot. Left knee down. I just want to say something real quick. I don't know if you can hear me when I turn away from the camera, but I was telling Tyler, left foot, right foot. I was giving the heads up of what our anticipated pitch location was. And then if you notice, when he would make his move, he'd make his uh, mitt move, his relaxation, in the direction of the anticipated pitch location. Now we'll do some left knee with the same kind of setup. <laughs> left knee, short. Left knee. Or middle. <laughs> Another thing to point out, remember at the beginning, we did those windshield wipers with the weighted bat, the pronation and supination. You notice when he's receiving these, when it's low in the zone, we'll almost always be in a thumb down, thumb around six o'clock, and you see he's snapping his mitt right back to that horizontal position. Get the mitt flat, giving the umpire a nice, consistent look. Um, go and go right knee, left foot. Just do a couple middle and give me a subtle lift. Just take the bottom of the knee. Miss the pocket now. So you notice those last few reps there, I went ahead and threw it in the strike zone. I just want him to get used to go ahead and move a little bit, even though it's already in the strike zone. I'll say it again. If when the pitch is in the strike zone, we stick it, and the pitch is just out of the strike zone, we move it, the umpire will pick up on that. We want to be consistent with the look that we're giving him. Okay, so uh, from there, what I would typically do is go into live, either start feeding balls into a pitching machine. I actually prefer my catchers to work on their receiving out of a hand, so I would back up and pitch to them. But that's a, a typical progression we can do. Again, there's a whole bunch of different things we can do. We can do mini Frisbees. We can do other mini balls. We can actually flip Frisbees. We can do wrist weight receiving. We can do angled receiving. We can do jump pivot receiving. All these different things we can do. I just don't have time to cover everything. Um, but that's a typical progression there. So again, we did the muscle activation or CNS activation. We did the pocket awareness. We did the mitt manipulation or just the receiving mechanics. And then we progress up to live. So a quick review on that is going to be uh, number one, most important thing in receiving is timing. How are we on time? By relaxing in our anticipated pitch location move. Number two is move the ball. And number three is give the umpire a nice consistent look. So that's receiving. Um, and again, I know some of you probably have some questions, but we're going to save them to the end. So write down your questions. And then when we're done with discussing all the different skills, then we'll actually get into the questions. So that's the end of the receiving side of things. And I know that was the quick version, but again, I have a lot to cover here. Um, next, Just I want to one quick thing, Tyler, I mean to cut you off there. They can add in the, there's a Q and A section uh, that you won't see in the chat. Um, I, I can see over here. So if they want to just drop those in now and I'll, I'll save them, make sure that you get through your presentation. We'll get to them at the end. So um, go ahead, sir. Thank you. Perfect. Yeah. And thank you for pointing that out. Um, so now I want to talk about blocking on the blocking side of things uh, uh, in particular for young youth catchers. I call it the difference maker. And what I mean by that is everyone thinks they can be a catcher until they need to block. That's going to be the decision maker, the difference maker. You know, there's different ways we can call it. Uh, my point of that is this kind of leads into my big three. The number one most important thing in blocking is going to be mindset. We have to have a no fear mindset. We have to go into an understanding that I can do everything correct and it still might hurt a little bit. That's just the life of a catcher, right? I can be on time, get to great position, posture, all that set up perfectly, and the ball smokes me in the bicep or hits me in the point of the shoulder or somewhere where there's no padding. So it's very important that we get comfortable being uncomfortable. I always put it this way, human instinct, instinct means it just, it's in us. When something's flying at you, instincts say move, bob, weave, duck, get out of the way but catchers have to go against their instincts and jump in front. In particular with young catchers, that can be pretty challenging. Again, uh, you know, I'm always honest with my catchers when I'm working with them and say, this might hurt. And, and honestly, sometimes I'll purposely hit them in the arm or hit them in the mask just to get them used to the feeling and the sound and the, you know, what goes along with blocking the ball. So mindset by far is number one, most important thing in blocking. Um, we have to have that no fear attitude, that no fear mindset. 
a second component to mindset is going to be to always anticipate or always expect the ball to be in the dirt. Regardless of what pitch you've called, what pitcher's throwing, it might be your stud all-star pitcher that is almost always throwing in the strike zone. Always expect it to bounce. So you have that little thought in the back of your head. So when it happens, we're going to react quicker and move quicker. If you're anticipating or guessing or expecting a strike and they bounce it, you're going to move slower and probably are not going to get to it. So number one thing in blocking is mindset. Number two is going to be what transition we make into blocking position. Now, keep in mind, I'll touch, touch on this now. Uh, the one knee setup is becoming very popular, right? They found that setting up on one knee is going to help us get a lot more strike calls. And like we were just talking about a minute ago, receiving is the most important thing, the most impact on an at-bat, an inning, and a game than anything else we do. So if they found that setting up on one knee is going to help me get more strike calls, it's something that I might go ahead and try and work on and get comfortable with. Sometimes at my camps, I'll set kids up on one knee and it feels totally uncomfortable. They feel locked up. It just takes some time and reps to, to get used to it. With that said, I will say this, it's honestly is not for everybody. You, yes, you can still have some success with receiving from a traditional setup. A perfect example is Austin Barnes with the Dodgers. He's almost always in a uh, traditional setup, literally like 99% of the time he's in a traditional setup. Um, and he's a perennial top 10 receiver in the league. So you do not have to get on one knee but it has been proven to improve receiving success. So it's something to work on. So I kind of jump back to receiving a second because that leads into blocking. There will be times where you're set up on one knee because you're really focused on getting that strike call and the pitcher bounces it. Yes, you can still block from a one knee setup. And we'll talk about the differences in the stances there. But uh, all this came from talking about the transition down into blocking position. <coughs> Excuse me. We're going to, uh, I'll have Tyler turn to the side. We'll use the tape, uh, Coach. And you can move home plate out of the way now for the blocking. There's two different techniques we'll use to get down into blocking position from a traditional setup. One is called the drop. Some coaches call it the replace. Your knees are replacing your feet. And then another is going to be the fold or attack method. The drop or replace method is, again, your knees replace your feet. It looks like this. If you notice where the tape is, his feet are right on the tape. Watch where his knees end up. So he kicks his feet out and drops straight down. That's going to be the drop or replace. Now watch, he'll start his feet on the tape again. And now this is going to be the fold or attack method. Notice his feet stay put and his knees fold forward. Okay, so those are a couple different. And there's actually going to be instances where you might even kick back. You might even lose a little ground in order to soften the blow. Here's the key. You're going to use all those different techniques I just talked about. And again, you might even be on one knee, but the key is catch it with your belly button. Do whatever you got to do to make it hitch in the belly button. If you can make it hitch in the belly button, that's going to help you control the ball. And when we block, we need to keep it within like a two to three foot radius or an arm's reach. If it gets outside of there, we almost have no chance of throwing a runner out, especially if they've done their job and they've, they've got a good jump when they saw that ball hit the dirt. So we need to keep it close. So again, sometimes you might need to come forward. You might need to cut down the distance between where the ball's hitting the ground and you put your body on those pitches that are thrown out there by home plate. They're hitting on home plate or just past it. We might fold forward. And then you'll have those ones that are almost catchable. It's a little bit deeper. Now we're going to kick out and drop. You're going to use both of those techniques. So again, that's the second thing. Uh, number two on the list of most important things in blocking is that what transition do we use to catch the ball with our belly button? Drop or replace, fold or attack. If we're on one knee, we're already down there. Little side note, since I just said that, um, one of the most common faults we see with block, uh, during blocking is being late, not getting down to the ground in time to stop the ball. Well, when you're on one knee, you're already down there. So there's some benefits to that as well, okay? Number three on the list of the most important things in blocking is gonna be uh, once we're down on the ground, what does our body position and posture look like, all right? The key is we need to smother it. If the ball is hitting the ground relatively close to us, your chest will literally be almost parallel to the ground. So if you notice Tyler here, watch his body position, his posture. You can just get down already and then just get way over the top of the ball. Yeah. So his chest is literally almost parallel to the floor. That If the ball is going to hit the ground, it's going to come up and hit him, and it's going to go right back down into the ground. So if the ball is almost catchable, you've done a drop or replace technique, and you're, you want to get way over the top of the ball, 
you might even potentially kind of sink your hips back as the ball is hitting you and chest more over the top and direct the ball back into the ground. So as it's coming in, the, the hips sink and the chest goes over the top. If the pitch is thrown shorter, so it's out by home plate or sometimes even in front of home plate, now our posture is going to change and we're going to be a lot more upright because those pitches typically bounce a lot higher. Okay, so you see his mitts down, but his chest is up on these. These ones aren't ideal. It's our job, obviously, as a catcher to stop everything that's thrown in the dirt, do our best to at least knock it down. When it's thrown short like that, that's going to hit higher on our body. Again, it's not ideal. Those typically go out like a bunt and go a little farther than we want, but it's better than letting it go to the backstop. So your posture is going to change. One thing that doesn't change, and go ahead and turn and face the camera. One thing that doesn't change is going to be your mitt position. Okay, Your mitt is always going to be in the five hole. All right, so blocking the space in between your legs, whether you're in a traditional blocking stance, go ahead and kick out one leg, in a one knee setup, okay, right knee down, left knee down, doesn't matter, your, your mid is always going to be down. One of the most common mistakes we see is catchers either don't get their mid all the way to the ground or they get it to the ground and then lift it. We need to keep that mid down. So again, our, our third most important thing on the list is going to be our body position. The reason it's number three is you're going to see all kinds of variations. The bottom line is stop the ball. But uh, your mitt position is, is universal, and then we want to smother it whenever possible. All right? So number one is mindset. No fear and anticipate. Okay? Don't guess. We don't want to guess wrong. We anticipate or expect. If it's in the dirt, we're ready for it. If it's not, we just stay balanced and receive the pitch. Number two is what transition do we use to get into blocking position? And then number three is going to be, what do we look like once we're down there? Mid position block in the five hole, posture changes depending on depth of pitch. Okay. So from there, um, I'm going to have Tyler demonstrate. When I do blocking, I always like to kick it off again, just like we did for receive, receiving with the muscle activation and CNS activation. When I do blocking, I like to incorporate hip mobility, flexibility, and strength. So um, a great warm up uh, to kind of get your body and hips and ankles ready for blocking, get them in blocking mode, is what we call bootstrap squats. And it looks like this. You can take your mask off if you want. And I'm just going to have him do a few reps, just real quick demonstration. So you get your feet separated. Uh, you can face the camera. Yeah. About shoulder width apart. Some of you are going to be more comfortable wider. Some of you might be, need to be a little more narrow. But to get in a comfortable spot with your toes slightly turned out, you're going to reach down and grab your shoes, grab your feet. Sink down. He's going to start off and just spend a few seconds kind of shifting back and forth, pushing, go ahead, stay down there, push out with his elbows, kind of pushing out on his knees, getting the groin loosened up. Then from there, he's going to lift the hips. That's going to stretch out his hamstrings. Just hold for two to three second count, drop the hips. Now he's going to reach up with his right arm, come back down, reach up with his left arm, come back down, and now reach up with both arms and come back down. So the arm reaches are gonna help with T-spine mobility. When we're blocking, we just talked about it, your posture is super important. T-spine is just your mid-back. You have your cervical spine, your lumbar spine, and your thoracic spine, your T-spine is in the middle. We need to be able to maintain that posture while we're blocking, and that's a great way to get all the T-spine muscles and joints and everything activated and ready to go. Okay, so uh, just one more rep of that. So he squats down, puts his elbows inside his knees, Pushes out a little bit, loosen up the groin, loosen up the ankles. Okay, now he's going to lift the hips, stretch the uh, hamstrings out, sink back down, right arm. Notice he's looking up at his hand, rotating his head with his uh, torso, left arm, and then both arms. He's trying to get his arms all the way up, and he, I guarantee he's feeling some tension in that mid-back. So bootstrap squats is a great way to kind of loosen everything up and get ready for blocking, get in blocking mode. It's actually... Um, as uh, I'm actually not sure who posted that, but it says great mobility exercises. Me, <laughs> okay, awesome. Yeah, it's, it's, it's perfect. It's great for a, a pregame warm-up. It's going to loosen up a lot. I like using it before, uh, before blocking. Another great hip mobility exercise um, that I do a lot at my events, I probably have some catchers on here or parents of catchers that have been to my events already, but you'll see this one all the time at my events. This is a quadruped series sometimes called a fire hydrant series because of uh, it looks like a dog peeing on a fire hydrant. But you notice that he's on his hands and knees, his elbows are straight, and his eyes look straight between his hands. We want to maintain a neutral uh, spine during this whole exercise. He's going to lift his leg out to the side five times. Nice, smooth tempo. 
Then he's gonna do forward circles five times. So reach back, then bring it forward, reach back, then bring it forward. Then he's gonna do backward circles. So do the same movement in the opposite direction. So go forward, out and back five times. And then he's gonna do what we call quadruped scorpion. So it brings his knee toward his chest and then tries to basically touch his heel to his back of his head. Without too much posture arching, this is for the hip. We don't wanna do like this big back bend thing. He's doing it perfectly right now. And basically what it is, is he's moving, that's good coach, that he's just moving his hip in all the different planes of movement. So I have him do five on, of each exercise on one leg, then five of each exercise on the other. That's a great way to get the hips ready to, to, for the wear and tear of doing a bunch of blocking drills, okay? Um, so from there, after we do the muscle activation and loosening up there, to get in blocking mode, there's a three ball dry run blocking drill. This is something y'all can do at home. Uh, um, this is a pretty common one, so this probably isn't a surprise for anybody. Some of you may be new for, but this is something you can do at home when you don't have someone to throw to you. So three ball blocking. So I put one in front of his left foot, one in the middle, and one in front of his right foot. So basically what he's gonna do is I'll start in a traditional setup and then drop down and block the ball in the middle. And he's just checking his body position and balance. We wanna be able to stick the landing. Uh, you know, once we've blocked, the job's not done. We have to be able to get up and get it quickly. So dropping and blocking and balancing is a great way to check and see are my hips too high, is my chest too low, am I turned, am I crooked? We wanna hit the, hit the landing and stick it and be nice and balanced. Now he'll go toward his right foot. Then he'll get back up and go toward his left foot. And again, he's just gonna pause at the bottom, check his balance, check his body position, okay? We, he went a little far on that one. We wanna make sure we, we end up squared up. So our goal is to catch it with our belly button. So he overshot that one just a hair. We want it to set up, square up right behind it, center up on it so it hits us in the belly button. We can also practice this from the one knee setup. So go ahead and go, just pick a knee coach. Um, actually turn to the side. Um, so notice right now that his left toes are pointed back. He's resting on his shoelaces. If I might need to block, I'm going to get into more what's called a track start. So I'm going to point my toes down and now he has pressure on the ball of his foot. So now he can push and slide to his right. He can push with his foot that's down and push to his left. So that's the difference in the one knee setup. If you need to get in blocking mode, just adjust that down foot so you can make sure you can uh, push in either direction. All right, so turn back. So obviously if he's on one knee and the pitch is thrown in the middle, he's already there. So all he's gonna do is just put his mitt down. Boom, cool. Um, and actually I wanna point out one more thing. Notice that he has his right foot relatively close to him. Some catchers, if they know they might need a block, they'll kick it out some like he just did. Some coaches will call it like a modified kickstand. Some even like to go a little farther. Okay, uh, not, just keep your foot flat. Yep, so right in there. So your, your foot position is gonna be unique to you. Every catcher has different mobility, strength, flexibility, uh, explosiveness in their hips, all that stuff. It's all, so you need to find what works for you. Some will keep their foot completely tucked under. Some will go modified kickstand. JT Rumuto will do, he'll block laterally from a full kickstand position where his leg's fully extended. He'll put his foot down so he can push, but that's pretty rare. He's pretty athletic. He's, he's obviously a world-class athlete, but it's going to be unique to you. But go ahead and show him a couple lateral there, coach. So um, down on one, down on one, yep. So he's set up there. If he needs to push and go to his left, it looks like this. Overshot it again, too explosive. And then he's gonna go one to his right and do his best to center up on it so it hits him right in the belly button. So he sets up in the one knee. Now he's pushing with that down leg and he gets set up there. So just three ball dry run blocking is a great way to get into blocking mode, all right? From there, I like to do what I call a sit and get hit series. This is gonna be a quick version because time's flying. So he's going to get down into a traditional blocking position. Of course, yeah. So uh, turn facing. Sorry. So traditional blocking position. All he's going to do, the only movement is tuck in his chin. And I'm just standing right here in front of him, bouncing. Again, I know not everyone has access to a thrower, so you can always throw the ball into a wall and then drop down and have the ball bounce back into you. You can also do this sit and get hit from a one knee setup. So he's left knee down, mid down, get the chest over the top, 
and tuck the chin. And tuck the chin. Switch knees. So that's just start down in blocking position and get comfortable with the ball hitting you. Get in, get in blocking mode. Then we can work on getting our hands in proper position. So the next step in the sit get hit series looks like this. Notice he starts his hands up and then flips the mitt when it's time to block. Same thing from the one you set up. Well, you get the idea there. I'm just kind of doing a quick version because I'm running out of time. We're still going to talk about throwing. So uh, from there, we practice in the blocking position. We practice getting the hands in proper position. Then we can put it all together. He's just going to work on dropping and blocking. So add in the drop from a traditional secondary. It looks like this. So up and ready. And drop. Up and ready. Drop. And then again, we do that same thing from a one knee setup. So that sit and get hit series, in my experience, for any parents or coaches of young catchers on here, this is a great way to get them comfortable with the ball hitting them. Just put them in their blocking position and spikes and balls into the ground. Um, when you throw it right underneath them, it typically hits them in the belly button. That's not always the case in a game. So we want to get them comfortable getting hit everywhere. So the shorter you throw it, the higher up on their body it's going to hit. And then you can purposely, not necessarily throw it hard, but you can purposely throw it off center and have them hit them on their side. And then you can even hit them in the arm sometimes just to get them used to that feel. And again, it sounds funny, but get comfortable being uncomfortable. Get them used to the pain. Sometimes it hurts. Obviously, you can always start off with wiffle balls, tennis balls, those squishy balls, the safety balls, and work your way up to baseballs and softballs. Um, but the reality of it is they're going to get hit by baseballs or softballs in the game. So we want them comfortable with that heavy ball, the actual ball hitting them and get them comfortable being uncomfortable. So sit and get hit series is a great way to do it there. Um, from there, I like to, if our goal is to catch the ball with our belly button, we can do no hands blocking. This is one of my go-to. So you see he starts down. This is just in a traditional secondary. He gets up and ready. And I bounce it, and he's just going to drop down. So he, he kind of folded forward on that one and ended up hitting him right in the cup. What he probably could have done better is more dropped on that one, so it would have bounced and hit him in the belly button. So he just folded forward on that one. So a couple more reps here. Cool. And we can go lateral on these as well, go side to side. Those first couple right at him, we'll go left foot. And then we'll go right foot. So no hands blocking, getting the catcher, you know, comfortable with the concept of using their body to stop a ball in the dirt rather than trying to pick everything. There will be instances where we will pick. Um, I get DMs all the time. My coach yelled at me for not blocking a fastball, a spike fastball. You literally almost, it's, it's almost humanly impossible to drop and block a spike fastball. You become a hockey goalie. Glove save, kick save, elbow save. Do whatever you can to knock it down. You not, will not necessarily be able to get to actual blocking position on spike fastballs for any older catchers um, or coaches of older catchers when you're, you know, when you're trying to block a slider, a cutter, a hard fastball. Um, we become a hockey goalie. And you'll see that all the time on the, on the guys on TV, the big leaguers. So after the no hands blocking, then we'll typically do go and grab your mitt. I'll do just like we did on the receiving, a short toss block. So I'm just, I'm like, I don't know, 15, 20 feet out in front of Tyler right here. I have my hand down. We'll do some one knee on this one too. So traditional here. Ready? Cool. I just call this block and balance. He's just going to hit and balance and see where the ball ends up and see what his body position feels like. Let's go left foot. Cool. Nice ball control on that one. We'll go right foot. Out of instincts, he's used to grabbing that ball after he blocks, but I actually like to catch it to freeze, and let's see where the ball ends up. Does it rebound out toward the pitcher? Does it end up right underneath? And that's going to tell us if we use the correct transition and our body position, was that correct? And then we're also checking balance. You can also do this from a one-knee setup, but notice he's starting off in his transition stance like he just gave a sign. 
and then work on getting set up on the one knee, and then I block from, or I throw from there. Um, I'll go uh, left knee on this one. And then right knee on this one. Uh, yeah, sit the right knee down and I'll go, uh, I'll go to your left. Cool, so again, we work from traditional setup, right knee down, left knee down, and, and make sure we're comfortable with all those different options. From there, just like I said on the receiving, I would back up and either feed balls into a machine or pitch live. I prefer my catchers to work off a of live, seeing it out of a hand. There are definitely benefits working off a machine, but I prefer out of a pitcher's hand just because you get the variability and the randomness to it, which is more game-like. We want it to be as game-like as possible, okay? So again, quick review. The big three on blocking, number one is mindset. Number two is what transition do I use to get down? Number three is what do I look like once I'm down? So on the transitions, it's drop or replace or fold or attack, depending on the speed and depth of the pitch. And then once I'm down, universal, my mitt's always covering that five hole, whether I'm in a traditional or one knee, and my chest is gonna be over the top if it's close to me, and a little more upright if it's farther away from me. But those are the big three and some fundamentals and drills and exercises for blocking. So I wanna save time for Q&A, so we're gonna jam through this throwing progression. Um, I'll tell you the, the with throwing side of things, so let me get a quick drink. For throwing, I have what I call my big four instead of big three. Number one, very similar to blocking, is going to be mindset. If you're back there behind the plate, in your mind, thinking, please don't steal. I hope this runner doesn't steal. I'm not going to be able to throw them out if they steal. Like, if you don't have any confidence, if you lack that aggressiveness and confident mindset, you're not going to have much success. So one aspect of mindset when we're in the throwing is you want to, in your mind, be challenging that runner to go, please try and go so I can throw you out. In baseball, if the pitcher does their job, I'm going to throw you out, right? You want to have that confidence. And then also we want to anticipate, very again, very similar to blocking, where know the other team. If, it's, if you're playing in a tournament where it's a team you've never played, then it's obviously you can go by body type or where they're bad in the order, and that's going to give you a pretty good idea who the fast runners are. If it's a center fielder and he's a leadoff guy and he gets on first, he's probably going to steal. So now we're anticipating that steal. We might adjust our stance a little bit. Um, and our mindset is definitely expecting. So if it does happen, we're going to react quicker and move quicker. So number one is mindset. Number two is going to be quick hands. Um, what do I mean by quick hands? That's getting rid of the ball as quickly as possible. Real quick explanation to that. I'll scoot over a little bit. So uh, the ball is always moving faster than we can. So we want to let the ball come to us. We don't want to reach out for the ball. Let it come to us. Sometimes I'll call it T-Rex arms. You get, you've seen the dinosaur T-Rex with the bent arms really short arms. We want to be a T-Rex, with nice short arms, let the ball come to us. We want to exchange or get the ball out somewhere around the midline of our body. We do not want to bring the mid all the way back to our face and then finally pull the ball out. We want to get it out as quickly as possible and that's going to end up somewhere around the midline to our body. If it gets back toward our right shoulder, that's typically a sign that we miss the grip and we're trying to find the grip, get it out as quickly as possible. Okay, and then the next thing with the uh, quick hands is going to be our arm shape and our arm path. Our arm shape is we want to keep the ball inside and above our elbow. So we do not want to exchange and go down. Now the ball is below my elbow. We don't want to go out. We want to keep the hand above and inside. And then obviously the arm path is straight to throwing position. The shortest distance between two points is a straight line. Keep it as straight as possible. As the baseball is going up and back or the throwing arm is going up and back, my mid arm goes up and out, okay? So that's kind of some keys to quick hands. Next on my list, number three is gonna be quick feet. And honestly, to keep it quick and simple so we have time for questions, quick feet basically just means get your right foot up, get your right foot back down, and get the ball on its way. The longer the step we take, the longer the ball's in our hand, the uh, less chance we have of throwing at that runner. So nice, short, quick footwork. Pick it up, put it down, and get it on its way. I will explain this. Everyone's going to have their preferred footwork. There's actually different styles that we can use, um, different methods. Everyone has their preferred, but you need to prepare yourself to do all of them. So if there's a right-handed batter up, and I'm going to get out of the way so Tyler can demonstrate this. So if there's a right-handed batter up, so there's someone standing here in his way, if you watch his footwork and you can kind of use that tape as a reference point, his right foot will come up and almost go right back down. It's just a little bit of a tap step or a jab step when there's a righty up. So go ahead and just do a little dry run. 
pick it up and put it right back down. It ends up right in the middle from where his feet started. But now if there's a left-handed batter up, so we have someone standing here, he needs to clear some space away from that batter. So he's gonna use more of what we call a replace technique and it looks like this. His right foot replaces his left. Now he's clearing a little space away from that left-handed batter. There will be instances where we might not even have to step with our right foot at all. So if the pitch is outside of his throwing arm shoulder, so he has to reach across his body, all of his way to shift it into his right foot, his right foot just stays planted and it looks like this. And then the final version is we actually use our knees as our feet and we end up throwing from our knees. So obviously throwing from the knees isn't for everyone. You need that elite level arm strength. I highly recommend all my young catchers out there practice this. And yes, right now you might be, now when I say practice, I mean in practice, not in a game. You, but at first you'll throw it and it might bounce, bounce and be rolling by the time it gets there. But you always want to have this tool in the toolbox, so to speak, this option to go to if the pitch location calls for it. But throwing from the knees will look something like this. Okay, so he just sets his, his left knee down. His left knee is like his left foot. He's pushing hard off of that right foot. Go ahead and, and do a full throwing motion and uh, watch, watch how he ends up in his follow through. So he drives and that right foot comes all the way forward. I'm sorry, that right knee comes all the way forward. So his knees basically replace his feet there, all right? So those are the different footwork techniques and those are all gonna be dictated by where the batter's standing, the pitch location, and then where we're set up in relation to the batter. But again, the bottom line is keep that step, in particular with our right foot, short, as short as possible. The biggest step we take would be on the replace technique, but trust me, you don't want to smack your hand upside the head of a left-handed batter who's swung and he's kind of hanging out over the plate. You want to clear a throwing lane so we can make that nice, clear, uh, clean throw to, to second base, okay? Um, so again, number one is mindset, number two is quick hands, number three is quick feet, and then finally, number four is going to be arm strength and mechanics. I actually have a whole series of exercises that I have my guys do at my camps and events and during my lessons, but I don't have time to cover all of those. Um, so with the, uh, with the throwing side of things, we're going to jump right into a quick foot exercise instead of doing any of the arm strength and stuff. You can do your band work, your Jager bands, your, um, uh, you know, your J band stuff. You, there's the, the weighted balls, all that stuff you would do pre-game or pre-practice, pre-throwing drills, um, but we're not doing those today. Um, some of my favorite quick feet exercises, one is going to be the, uh, there's jump rope is one of my favorites. Then there's going to be dot drill. There's going to be agility ladder. And then there's another one. We're going to use this piece of tape. It's called the line drill. And he's just going to do one quick round of it. We have forward and back jumps. We have scissors. So one foot in front, one foot behind. We have side to side. And we have crossovers. Nope, nope, turn, turn facing. So one, yep, cross, yeah, there you go. So you can do anywhere, that's good, coach. You can do anywhere between 10 seconds of each of those. So it'll be 40 full seconds of exercise. You can go as much as 15 seconds, 20 seconds, depends on how much time and, and you know, are you doing it as like a workout or a warm up? But this is a great way, very similar to the receiving where we did muscle activation and CNS, CNS activation, central nervous system. We're getting all the muscles in his legs fired up and prepared to move quickly. So jump rope, uh, jumping jack series, agility ladder, dot drill, the, all those different things. I like when I'm doing throwing, we'll kick it off with some type of foot quickness exercise. All right, from there, two knees. Resisted exchanges. All right, go ahead and come closer, coach, so you can see. So just like we had to get our feet fired up and the muscles that we're gonna use for, for quick feet, now he's getting his exchange muscles fired up and he's doing resisted exchanges. So that's just the resistance band. You can, there's all kinds of different variations and strengths of band. This is a medium strength band. He's gonna exchange and pull back. He, right now, as he's trying to get his arm back, he's pulling from his shoulder blades. He's trying to contract his shoulder blades, his scapula, and pinch them together. Go, go and hold on to the ball and do like five in a row. Boom, 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 boom. Oh, that's good. Go ahead and take the band off. So that's resisted exchanges. Again, kind of working on quick hands. When, we're, when we have the resistance and then we take the resistance away, it's going to be easier to move that way. Okay. So we have the resisted exchanges. Then we have, go ahead and back up a little bit. Mask on. 
Oh, you already have it. Two knees, face and knee. Two knee, the two knee, two ball exchanges. So keep it in there. So you can start off with weighted balls. You can start this off with bare hand. You can start off with baseballs. There's all kinds of variations. This is a step in the progression for quick hands I do. This is a two knee, two ball exchange drill. He has a ball in his mitt. I have a ball that I'm gonna to flip to him. As I flip, he exchanges the one that's in his mitt into his throwing hand, gets his arm back, and then has to receive the ball of the other one that I'm throwing to him. So it looks like this. Oops. Cool. The reason for the second ball, one of the most common mistakes we see is catchers tend to bring their mid arm entirely too far back. With that second ball coming at them, they exchange, then they have to keep their mid arm out in front where it should be to receive that second ball. So we did the resisted exchanges, we did the two knee, uh, two ball exchanges. And then the next step in the progression would be actually doing an exchange and making a throw. So it looks like this. Now Tyler's not loose, going back up just a little bit. Tyler's not loose, so he's not actually gonna throw. He's just gonna kinda go through a little half speed throwing motion. But I call this one knee quick catch. So we practice the exchange. Now we're gonna practice the exchange and adding the throw. So one knee quick catch would look like this. Just know that he would typically make the actual throw. Yep, you're good right there. Both hands up, so now just exchange and go through the. Cool, make sure you stay back and load up. Cool. So he starts to add a throw. Obviously, before we do any of these throwing drills, you want to go through a, a, an entire proper warm-up to make sure that your arm is loose. So after the one knee quick catch, then you can start off ball and mitt. Oh. He already kind of did this, but we'll have him just start ball and mitt and start to do the exchange and add in his footwork. So he's going to just do one rep of all the different footwork options we just discussed earlier. So right-handed batter, jab step. Left-handed batter, replace technique. Right-handed batter, load and throw. The pitch is outside of his right shoulder or down by the ground. And now throw from the knees without actually throwing. Cool. So he practices just starting with the ball in his mitt. Then we go into exchange and footwork with still no throw. So now... I'd be standing out in front of him, I'll add in my leg lift. He works on the timing of the transition, so it looks like this, right-handed batter. Left-handed batter. Right-handed batter outside his throwing shoulder. And then right-handed batter from the knees. I'm glad you didn't throw that. <laughs> so we're just working on the footwork off of an exchange. And then obviously the next step in the progression is to put it all together and actually make some throws, whether to be to a second base and obviously going to third base as well. So number one, mindset, confidence in our abilities and expect. Number two, quick hands. Number three, quick feet. Number four, arm strength and mechanics. And then that's a series of drills and exercises we do there. So there you go. I fit it all in in an hour, but I didn't leave everyone much time to ask questions. So we'll, we'll do as best we can to get some of these questions in here. Hey, Todd, that was awesome. A lot of really tactical stuff there people can use. So um, definitely going to want some replays. Uh, go back and check out the replay for this. Steve, you were asking about copy of the drills and mobility stuff and arm carry use. Definitely going to want to check out the replay to come back uh, and, and see this one. I'm sure Todd's got play on his social you can go out and and see some of these different drills and things like that uh we've got another one here uh with a threat of a runner stealing a base coach is there a particular knee that you want to have them put down so if you're going to be going from one knee setup um i've actually seen rio muto rio muto is a left knee down guy like every time he sets up on one knee his left knee's down and i've seen him throw from left knee but he is again he's world-class athlete so it's not necessarily for everybody what they found is it's actually much easier if you're in a throwing situation, but you still want to set up on one knee to get those strike calls. Setting the right knee down is easier. There's more rhythm to the move. If I have my uh, tilt the camera forward a little bit, that not uh, that yeah the whole the whole screen. There we go. So right knee down. 
here, the runner takes off. I drive up through my left leg and my right foot ends up underneath. So remember, I'm in my track start here. My le uh, right knee's down, left knee out of the way, set up here. I'm prepared to steal that low strike, but the runner takes off, drive up from my left, put my right foot down, and be ready to go. So if we're in a one knee setup in a throwing situation, it's probably best to go right knee down. There's a lot better rhythm to it. Good question. Very good. We got um, throwing to second base when the catcher gets in his power position. Where should the ball be facing, back towards the umpire or facing towards first? Another great question. These are awesome questions. So um, most, what's the best way to show this? I'm trying to get the right angle here. Most are to the side like this. Some are turned back. You'll almost never see it forward. So we definitely don't want it forward like a pie throw. We'll end up on the side of the ball throwing breaking balls. Most are slightly to the side or all the way back. Some are right in between there. But the natural slot or spot is typically kind of aimed out to the side, not necessarily all the way back to the umpire right in there. Beautiful. And last one here uh, from uh, Lance. What drill do you use to teach snap throws to first? Oh, and then I see another one about getting back to your feet after blocking. So I want to talk about that one too. There you um, go. Throwing to first. So your footwork, just like when we're throwing to second, your footwork will change depending on where the batter's standing. So if we have a right-handed batter up and we're picking it first, most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time you see those big boys throw from their knees because they don't have to clear any space away from a, a batter. If there's a left-handed batter up, um, it depends on where they're standing in the box. If they're just in a center spot or maybe slightly forward, we have plenty of space. So we'll basically just pick our right foot up and put it right back down and get our shoulders turned. If it's a, uh, I'm sorry, I said that backwards. If they're, if they're up in the box, I'll probably use a replace. So my right foot replaces my left, get my shoulders turned and let it fly. And but if the guy's back in the box, I can't replace, I'm gonna throw right into him. So my right foot picks up and goes right back down. And now I have some space back from that uh, left-handed batter. So righty up, work on throwing from your knees or use the replace technique, right to left. Um, left to target, let it fly. If there's a lefty up, especially if they're back in the box, you need to clear some space so your right foot just picks up pivots and goes back down so you can stay back from the batter and not run into them. Um, I know you took your stuff off, but you don't, you don't need that. That knee jumps. So uh, another question I saw pop up there, techniques to get back to your feet after blocking. Um, First of all, I'll show this is, this is a great way to work on the explosiveness and get up as quickly as possible. So he's holding an eight pound med ball and he's just gonna do some knee jumps. Cool. So you see he started on the ground on that one and then lifted. He can also, to make it more challenging, hold it right in front of your chest coach and just keep it there and now jump from there. So swinging the ball actually helps create some momentum. Holding it still makes it a little bit more challenging. So anytime we work against resistance, and then take the resistance away, that's gonna help develop the explosiveness we want. So there's block and hop, and he was just doing the hop. There's a press out or a walk out. So just move the ball to the side. Get down in blocking position now, just kind of press out of that. So he just kind of, that was more of a walk out. Um, hopefully I don't blow out a hip, but I'm gonna show because I'm, I'm trying to be quick here, guys. So there's block and hop. There's a walkout like Tyler just demonstrated, and then you'll see some guys press out. So they just press up out of that blocking position there. So those are the different techniques to get up after a block, and that med ball resisted knee jumps is a great way to build up that explosiveness. Whew, out of breath. Great questions, everybody. What else do we got? Got an anonymous here. I might have missed this in the beginning. Uh, this will be the last one. But what are the instances where you have the right or left knee down as opposed to regular? Cool. So last question. And, of course, it's one that I could talk about 15 minutes about. So there's different reasons we set down different knees. Number one, uh, like I brought up Rio Muto, it's a comfort thing. So everyone's hip mobility, flexibility, strength is different. Um, Rio Muto is always left knee down. Then you have guys like uh, Tyler Flowers, who's like both knees down, like right knees down sometimes, left knees down sometimes. They alternate, they switch. Sometimes they start up and drop one. Um, but first is comfort. Number two, another reason is where the umpire is to kind of open up their view. 
Um, so if it's a left-handed batter, you'll drop your right knee down. If it's a right-handed batter, you drop your left knee down, open up the umpire's view. Setting down that knee also helps take away the low strike reference point on that umpire side. Sometimes if we receive a pitch below the knee, they'll call it a ball. If you take that knee down out of the way, they don't have that reference point anymore. You might be able to steal more low strikes. And then also sometimes it's anticipated pitch location to clear space, get your knee out of the way because you're anticipating the pitch to go in that area. So those are the different reasons we'll set down one knee or the other. Love it, Coach. Well, anybody drop in here in the comments uh, while, we, while Coach is sharing his contact information. And maybe if Coach has got time, I know he's got a ton of knowledge to share. We can bring him back for a part two. Uh, but, Coach, you know, where can they find you and uh, reach out to you with questions that they have? Awesome. Yeah, so uh, I don't know if that was you, but someone just put up uh, the catching guy on social media. So I'm on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. You can just search the catching guy on any of those platforms. Obviously, the word catching, a whole bunch of us catching coaches pop up, but I'm the only the catching guy. So Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, the catching guy. And then my website is thecatchingguy.com. Pretty simple. Um, you can DM me, private message me, message me, email me, um, you know, whatever's easiest for you. Uh, during this, the, the, the time that we're all in, this challenging time, my, my uh, DMs have been blown up. I have so many. So for those of you that might be watching that are like, I already asked him a question. He's never answered me. It's really hard to keep up. There's been so many because everyone's home and just social meeting it up. So um, bear with me, ask me, and I may get to it. If I don't, just re-ask it, send it again, and, and I'll, I'll do my best to help everybody out. And I'd love to come back on again for sure. Awesome. Uh, email coach, or you want him just to reach out on the DMs? Um, DMs is probably best, but I can give the email. It's on the website anyway. So Team Coburn, T-E-A-M, Team Coburn, Coburn, obviously my last name, at thecatchingguy.com is the best email. Great. Just put it in the chat there. All right, Todd, thank you so much for coming on today. A lot of great knowledge there and a lot of tactical tips, things you guys can apply right away. Uh, it's great that, you know, you can – do these stuff, you know, while, while you guys are at home right now being shut down and not necessarily needing a, a pitcher or, you know, team practice to, to get better as a catcher right now. Yeah, one last thing before we go. I know you got to get going to the next round, but I'll just say that and, and anyone who's following me should know this because I've been posting about it a lot, but I've, I've started a scholarship program for all the players to help everyone during these tough times be able to afford to get training online, and we're all doing this online stuff. Um, so I have a, a Mitt Magic program that's all done online. A lot of my favorite drills and exercises, uh, me explaining the fundamentals. I have Drop Your Pop 2.0, um, I'll focus on throwing. I'm in the process of working on a, a Be A Wall program for the blocking side of things. And then for the coaches that might be listening here in this, I started a grant program. I did a certification program for, for years. Um, I've actually uh, transitioned it into just a coach training program. We're providing grants. It's typically a very expensive program, about $800. It's all the way down to just $97 to try and, again, to help everyone out and just get as much information as they can during these uh, crazy times. So um, email me, DM me, PM me, whatever you want to call it, and I will get you guys the links for all of the grants and uh, scholarships if you're interested. Awesome. Well, Steve, I know you were asking about uh, some more, uh, more of those drills, so that would be a good one to check out. And just to update everybody, Coach Bill has got pushed back about 20 minutes, so 2.20 Eastern time here this afternoon will be uh, his start time for this next one and be sure to give us a follow on twitter at baseball clinics and we'll be keeping everybody up to date on any of the changes that will be happening that way and then um anything else coach you got for him that's it i'm out of breath right. i'm gonna drink my cold yeah, water and there you go refresh <laughs> all right thanks everybody and we'll see you on the next one thanks for having me